Hi everyone, Happy New Year, and I'm here to show you an example and walkthrough of a technique I like to use and an HDA I'm giving away to the community um, to help uh, do some art directable clustering for destruction sims. Although I suppose it could be useful for other things besides destruction if you want to get creative with it. Uh, if we take a look at this simulation here, it's pretty, you know, standard smashy RBD sim. And, you know, what makes this simulation interesting is this nice, you know, mix of large held together clustered sections and lots of small little pieces. So uh, I often like to use geometry grouping to define what all of these clustered together sections look like. That means I can, you know, easily define this procedurally or with manually sculpting some of that grouping geometry. And let's take a look at how this is set up. I'll just kind of gloss over the building first. Uh, you know, I've just done some basic walls and floors with some booleaned out windows, and I've generated some noisy cutters, which is typically how I do most of my fracturing. Um, I have been using the RBD material fracture to run the actual fracture process, um, but I typically use that uh, not with any of the presets on here, but with the custom option, fracturing per piece, uh, typically turned on, uh, scatter cutting geo turned off, uh, input cutting geo turned on so that it just uses all of these input cutters. And because I often do trimming on the cutters already, um, I often will turn off this extra trim on this RBD material fracture. So, you know, with these detailed cutters, this gives us a pretty finely fractured building that looks like this. Now that's already looking kind of cool, uh, but we don't want the building to just shatter into a million little pieces like this. You know, as I mentioned, what really makes destruction sims look interesting are when you have, you know, these large, nicely defined, uh, yeah, interesting shaped uh, big sections. And that's where this HDA comes in. Uh, I've often done this by hand, uh, you know, just setting up this uh, for each loop with feedback to grab all of my different grouping geometries and create clusters based on those. And um, yeah, it's definitely a good case for something that uh, is nice to have wrapped into a tool. Um, so before we get into the tool itself, take a look at you know, the geometry that we're using to define all of these clusters. So I'm just uh, first scattering some spheres on this building and noising those up a bit. And those will be kind of my, you know, random procedural cluster shapes. But it's always nice to have some perhaps manually sculpted areas or at least kind of manually placed sections as well. Uh, so I have this extra sphere that I've put on the bottom of the building and noise that up a bit just to yeah define this one large passive section on the bottom and we mix those together and then together this will define all of those large interesting cluster shapes on our shattered building so i've got this hda that i made to you know help set this up and this can work a couple different ways uh, before we get into those uh, two different variations um, of you know how it works. Um, we can take a look at some of the visualization on here uh, with this visualize option that will just give us color feedback for where those clusters are. All of these black sections are unclustered and we can do an exploded view as well. You know, just options to kind of see what that looks like right away. And this will also create a cluster attribute that you can change the name of here if you would like. Good to leave that as default cluster though, because um, as you'll see shortly, that's what um, the, the RBD cluster SOP uh, expects as well. Um, and ultimately we can either use this attribute to create clustered constraints, um, or we can just 
double pack these objects to create larger aggregate pieces, essentially. Um, so uh, it's, you can't really tell the difference visually when looking at this clustered building. Uh, but if we switch this to bounding box display, maybe I'll turn off the visualize and turn off the exploded view. Um, with this pack clusters option turned on, you can see this is taking each of those clustered sections and packing it into one packed object. So essentially it's double packed. You have all your fractured packed pieces and those are packed again into larger sections. Um, and just uh, to give you control over whether, you know, the small pieces get double packed as well, you have this also pack unclustered pieces option, um, you know, just in case you care about some of them being double packed and some of them not being double packed. Um, you know, by packing on cluster pieces as well, then you keep that consistent. Everything is double packed. So afterwards, if you unpack once, then you'll have access to all of your individual packed fractured pieces again. Uh, let me know if that's confusing at all. But this is kind of an easy way to get these RBDs to behave as clusters uh, without dealing with constraints whatsoever. Um, but let's put this back on bounding box, turn off the pack clusters option, and this will um, essentially give us all of our individual pieces without repacking them. Um, but then we can use this cluster attribute to define our groups of constraints instead. So with this option, um, it requires a little bit more work to set up in the sim, but you know, using the option with constraints will certainly give you uh, more flexibility in the simulation and often, you know, in cases like this example here, more realistic behavior. Um, yeah, it could be worth the extra little bit of work to do that. Um, we can compare those two simulations here. Um, they'll be pretty similar, but you'll notice some difference between them. Now this is the version using constraints. Uh, it doesn't really have everything breaking up at the exact same time. The, break, the breakup kind of propagates across the building over the course of a handful of frames. I guess it still kind of propagates pretty quick. We can see this stuff here is cracking noticeably before the opposite side is. Um, the version of the simulation that doesn't use any constraints, that just uses double packing, is pretty similar, but you kind of see a lot more breakup on the opposite side of the building immediately. You know, depending on what your shot is, you may or may not care. Um, you know, for lots of quick cut action films or something, you don't necessarily need constraints if you just need things to just blow up, <laughs> you know, in these kind of quick cut sequences or whatever. Um, but yeah, in this case, you can see the, the results are pretty similar, but slightly not less nice without the constraints. Um, good to have both options. Uh, when you are using the constraints, we will leverage, as I said, this cluster attribute that is created on all of these pieces here. Uh, but we'll also need that cluster attribute copied to the constraints themselves. So I'm using an attribute copy SOP to copy uh, the cluster values that we've set in our HDA onto all of the constraints here. Um, and you know, before we go any further, I should also add that you know, we're using the constraints from the RBD material fracture process. But because we're doing a per piece fracture, um, the floors aren't necessarily connected to the walls. Uh, any pieces that were fractured individually won't be constrained together. So I'm using this connect adjacent pieces to find boundary connections between you know, pieces that were fractured separately and I'm merging those in with the constraints from the RBD material fracture so that yeah, the separately fractured pieces are also held together. So that's kind of an important step if you don't want, you know, uh, separately fractured sections to just fall apart from each other. So going back to 
the setup of these actual constraint clusters. As I mentioned, we're you know copying over that cluster attribute that we've you know, created with this cluster by geometry HDA. And we're copying that to all of the constraint geometry and matching by the name attribute. All of these constraint lines you know, all have points and all of these points define the RBD pieces that the constraints are attached to. So these name attributes on the points of the constraints will match the name attribute um, you know, on our actual fractured RBD pieces. So that helps us to correctly copy over this clustering information. And then we can use the RBD cluster SOP to define groups on our constraints. Um, I suppose you could probably also use the combined pieces option. Um, I don't use that as much with the RBD cluster SOP. Um, usually I'll just do constraint grouping, but feel free to play around with the combined pieces option if you'd like. And yeah, we don't really need to do anything different on this SOP, although now that I'm looking at it again, uh, I typically turn off the random detach on this RBD cluster SOP, and usually I'll use no additional cluster noise. Um, so I don't know if that would affect our sim results very much. Um, but yeah, let's take a look at the groups that are generated by this RBD cluster SOP based on uh, this cluster attribute that we've provided. So I've got this uh, separate little section here just to check the groups. Um, the RBD cluster SOP will create you know, groups as you've seen listed in the tool here. Um, so if we use a split to isolate each of those, first one we'll look at is the intracluster group. Um, and that will just give us all of the actual clustered together sections. And I can use some color feedback and you can see that all of these different um, you know, sections of this intracluster group match the uh, output of our cluster by geometry HDA. So that can be a good little sanity check to make sure this is working as you expect it to. Um, this cluster to cluster group shows constraints that are connections between two different clusters that are adjacent to each other. Um, cluster to piece gives you um, constraints attaching a cluster to a piece that isn't part of any cluster. Um, this last split here, which I haven't labeled, that's piece to piece. And this will just be constraints that are between pieces that are not part of any cluster whatsoever. And all of these groups are really helpful in case you want to define you know, different behaviors for each of those sections. All right, um, so then going over to the actual sim setup, um, you know, what we're mainly focusing on in this video is just that clustering process. So I'm not really gonna go too deep into the actual sim here, um, but we have our RBDs and I'm just uh, splitting aside the bottom cluster here uh, using the RBD configure to make this active equal zero. So that'll be a passive non-moving object. Everything else is active of one with some spin max and acceleration max set on that. Um, you could do you know, uh, both of these properties with one RBD configure SOP, but I often like to use splits to kind of visually separate different sections of my RBDs, uh, just because it helps you keep track of things a little bit better. Uh, but you could use uh, multiple sets of these you know, attributes tabs and RBD configure if you want to define multiple different sections in one node. And then looking at the constraints here, I'm first using an RBD constraint properties to set a default glue strength of 10, which is quite low, and propagation iterations of 40, so that you know an impact on one side will break constraints pretty far away from the initial area of impact. Um, I often find that, you know, sometimes you have to raise these propagation iterations up quite a bit to get nice looking sims. I think it's an often overlooked setting. 
And then on the intracluster group, so if you display that, you'll see just the, um, the constraints that this is setting properties for, because we've selected intracluster and that constraint group at the top there. Uh, for those, I'm just setting a strength of minus one so that those clustered together sections will always stay stuck together. Um, so yeah, running simulation on that yields the results that we already saw. I didn't really change much inside uh, this RBD bullet solver. It's pretty much all defaults, I think. I just, of course, added some ground collision. Um, and once again, that gives us this result here. Now, as I mentioned, you know, oftentimes you don't really need to use the constraint setup, um, in which case you can use the double packed option on this cluster by geometry here. Um, and if we look at this version of the sim and check out the bounding box view once again, you know, we have uh, this visual indication of all of those large chunks being defined by double packing them. Um, similarly to before, I'm splitting aside the base section to make that passive and setting the same properties on everything else. Actually, I've changed the acceleration max a bit on this version of the sim, but I think that's the only difference between those two simulations. And, you know, as you can see, we can get some pretty nice results as well without using any constraints for it. Um, so yeah, I hope this tool is really helpful for your own productions. Um, but actually, before I wrap it up, um, we can take a look at how this thing actually works. So let's you know, zoom in on this copy of our cluster by Geometry HDA here and allow editing of contents on that so we can take a look inside. Um, oh, one option I haven't really talked about yet is this sort grouping geom by size option, which will prioritize the biggest clustering sections. And if we turn that off, you'll see that um, we get a bunch of smaller clusters inside larger ones, um, which isn't necessarily problematic. Um, you know, this is still okay, uh, but I, it's often not my preference. In my opinion, it often looks a little bit more unnatural. So I generally prefer to prioritize the biggest clusters first so that you know, when this whole section is already clustered, uh, when we have another piece trying to cluster inside that, it will be ignored. Um, also, this um, geometry, I believe, is also dependent on the order of these, uh, these spheres um, if you're not resorting them based on size. So we can test that really quick here, uh, where we're merging in this large sphere with all of the smaller ones. Uh, let's display our clusters and reorder that merge. And you can see because now this large piece um, has been uh, merged in first, then that's going to take priority over the, the spheres that are merged in afterwards. So this kind of gives you another way that you can control how different cluster sections are prioritized. Um, but, you know, like I said, I usually just prefer to use this uh, size-based prioritization. Um, so let's jump inside this HDA. I'll just kind of quickly run through uh, how this works here. Um, first, we're using a connectivity on all of our grouping geometries so that we can measure each one of those individually to get the overall volume of each one of these grouping spheres. And then we're packing those, um, which isn't very obvious visually in the viewport. But if I drop in a packed edit and set that to bounding box, you can see we're just, um, yeah, packing each one of these distorted spheres. And then um, if we're using this option to sort them based on size, then this switch sop will uh, grab the output of this sort. It's just sorting by volume. And 
then we can move on to the actual for each loop that's doing most of the work. Uh, before talking about this for each loop, we can take a look at our input geometry. And uh, this is just getting a cluster value applied initially. It's got a value of minus one, which will mean it's not clustered at all. So that'll be our default. And then we're going to run this for each loop once for each one of our distorted spheres. Uh, that's one of the reason that I packed up all of these distorted spheres is so that each one is represented by one packed object, one point. So it's easy to isolate one at a time. And we can also quickly see how many of these there are based on the number of points in this packed version of that. So there are 71 pieces, 71 points, which means on this for each end, when we set this to iterate by count for a certain number of times, uh, we can set the iterations to be based on the number of points in this geometry for grouping uh, section here. So that has 71 points. That means this will run 71 times, as you can see here. And then for each iteration of this loop, we will isolate just one sphere. So if we take a look at this blast sop at the beginning of our loop here, this is just isolating one of these at the moment. Um, and this blast is looking at the metadata to determine which sphere to isolate. So um, if we check the spreadsheet for the metadata and look at the detail attributes, you can see that this has um, you know, information about each iteration shows the current iteration number, the value for this iteration, how many total iterations, uh, etc. And I'm attaching this metadata node as a spare input to the blast sop so that we can easily query that detail attribute, grab the current iteration number, and uh, delete everything except for that numbered primitive. So this will give us one of our spheres, which we can then use to group our geometry. We can check what's been grouped, which isn't the most exciting group in this case. It's kind of a small one there. And um, take a look at, so then we can set the cluster value also based on this iteration number. Um, and this is only going to set the cluster value if a piece hasn't been clustered already. Um, so if you take a look at um, all of the incoming geometry and look at the cluster values on here, um, this geometry has a number of clusters existing on it already. Uh, based on this cluster attribute, you can see we have numbers going from one up through 67. These pieces have already been clustered and lots of pieces with minus one that haven't been clustered yet. So after we do our clustering group, this wrangle will operate on everything within that group, but it only sets that cluster attribute if the current value is minus one. And then we get rid of our clustered group and we just run this again and again for every single grouping sphere. And in order for this to run properly, you'll also have to make sure that this for each begin is set to fetch feedback every time. I think that's the main thing to watch out for. The gather method should be set to feedback each iteration instead of merge each iteration. Um, if you uh, mix this up, then you could wind up with um, like 71 copies of your building geometry instead of reprocessing the same building geometry 71 times. So yeah, that's why I have to make sure that it's feeding back each iteration. Um, the begin is fetching the feedback and yeah, you're reprocessing the same geometry instead of making, making lots of copies of it. Um, and then that's most of the work done there at setting those cluster values. And then afterwards, we just do kind of a bunch of convenience stuff. Um, I'm also promoting that cluster 
to a primitive attribute, um, it's generally easier to select geometry based on primitive attributes instead of point attributes. So yeah, I like having this attribute on prims as well for that reason. Um, then, you know, some of these other steps here are just uh, different options that we've already looked at, whether we pack the clusters or not. Um, then we have our visualization options like so, and our optional exploded view and our packed edit for the uh, final display of our geometry. Um, so really, yeah, this is just kind of extra convenience and cleanup down here. Most of the work is done by this for each loop with feedback. Um, so yeah, I hope this tool is helpful for your projects and your productions. Um, if you have any questions about it, let me know. Um, I have a Patreon that I run where I do monthly quick tips, um, you know, sometimes HDAs as well. Um, kind of varies every month. So feel free to check that out if you're interested in, yeah, these monthly tips like this. And um, I've got a mailing list as well. So yeah, go to keithdigital.com to sign up for the mailing list or to uh, get the link uh, to this HDA download and etc. And yeah, let me know what you think. Hope that 2021 is awesome for everybody and good luck with all of your awesome Houdini work.